All right. So we are live, and I'm here with Jason Kristoff. Thank you, Jason, for joining us at the Healing Mastery Summit. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate you giving me the time to talk about this very valuable subject. Yeah, thank you, and uh, I appreciate you being here. So let me um, give you an awesome intro, um, and, and I can you know, just tell people about my experience with you, but I'm also going to follow your, uh, the intro here, which um, you know, Jason's developed a worldwide reputation uh, as a self-sabotage coach, uh, making complex issues easy to understand. And uh, you discovered early in your career that uh, after managing one of Canada's most successful weight loss clinics, um, that health and self-sabotage were inherently connected. You've been interviewed all across the world. I've seen your articles get shared hundreds of thousands of times. And uh, you've been on numerous podcasts, radio shows, and uh, basically, you're sharing this effective method dealing with self-sabotage, right? So um, we all know that you lead by example. Um, and <laughs> one of my favorite things about you is uh, the articles you post. But not only the articles, is the comments that you leave in the articles when somebody tries to combat what you're saying. Um, so... Uh, let, let's get into the, the concept of self-sabotage, but as this is the Healing Mastery Summit, um, one of the questions that we're asking everybody, just so there's a theme across the board, is what your definition of healing is. Well, my definition of healing, I believe, you know, when you're going to throw out an answer like that, it's important to tell people that everybody's capable of healing and healing. Healing can happen quickly or slowly, but it's always going to involve walking or integrating a bit more into uh, nature, more water, more sleep, more healthy food. So, you know, depending on how much we have to heal, that's going to be the distance into nature you're going to have to walk. I mean, there are other modalities, and a lot of those modalities are counterproductive to walking into nature and kind of re-establishing what it really means to be a human so if a lady was drinking you know three coffees a morning and she went down to one and she you know substituted in two two glasses of water on top of that she's healing mm. for someone like myself i continually walk farther into natural modalities and i i heal myself more and more every day mm. and sometimes as well people have to understand it's hard to walk that 365 days a year i tell people i tell them to use the base camp method where they dedicate potentially four weeks to getting involved with natural healing modalities and then potentially take a three-day break okay how they feel because it's it's like the base camp method because you can't walk say on mount everest mm. six base camps no one can walk the whole mountain in one try it's impossible so sometimes we have to get our gumption up and our courage up we plow ahead for four weeks and that really lets someone establish you know what health is they're going to sleep better have better temperament they're going to have more energy and then when they do take the break Sometimes they go a bit in reverse back to their old, their old ways, but it gives them a very valuable insight about the differences between the two ways of living. So anybody can heal, but it will always involve bringing more nature into your life as opposed to, say, um, science or something like that. We have to give – all our answers are in the past. They're yeah. not in the future. That's a powerful analogy because when you climb a summit – you basically have to climb and then come back down and then climb back up. So it's, you're basically talking about acclimating as it pertains to healing. Exactly. That's a, a lot of people find it easier to do that. If I told them they had to clean up themselves for their whole life, it's, it becomes too big a climb. Right. So we do it in, we do it in base camps three to four weeks at a time. It generally takes about, six weeks to really get the body into a metabolic position where a lot of the toxins are being taken care of and a lot of the neurological systems come back online given that they're not getting bombarded with toxins all the time right so okay so this is a great uh, way to kind of step into self-sabotage because 
people are being bombarded by these toxins, um, would you say that there, some people are doing it purposefully and then other people are just doing it unwittingly, like they don't know that they're doing it? Um, so what, what could be the difference between maybe self-sabotage and is there a difference? It's, it's, I would say, given my experience in the field, see, self-sabotage is when someone engages in behavior that's detrimental to their own greatness. Mm -hmm. And most of that, because the conscious mind would have a hard time believing that. Like if right. I told someone that they're eating unhealthy food because they, they're afraid of their own innate potential, the conscious mind will reject that and say, no, I'm in control, I'm choosing the French fries, I'm choosing you know, the unhealthy habits, I'm having the wine after work because it relaxes me. But if you get into how the subconscious mind works, you will see that all the unhealthy habits fall into a category, I call it like a weapons cachet. Like a, it's almost like the self-saboteur has a closet full of you know, various different uh, modalities by which they're going to keep themselves underachieving. Mm -hmm. They're going to keep themselves small. They're going to keep themselves mediocre. And the only reason the subconscious would, you know, puppet string you like that is because the subconscious is in charge of your defense. Mm. It, it develops safety protocol on your behalf and it does that by taking in sort of the information of the environment and the subconscious mind, uh, just to put it in perspective, the conscious mind, the part of the mind we're talking with right now is being shown to only be able to process 140 bits of information per second. And then they measured the subconscious mind and it was processing information at 11 million bits a second. Right. And that's how intent and how serious the subconscious mind downloads sort of behaviors that it, that it sees and observes in our environment because one of the basic safety protocols is mimicry. Right. So, and what it wants to do, the subconscious mind is wants to make sure to give you the appropriate behavior protocols so that you fit in with, you know, the tribe that you're living in. Mm. And that's where a lot of the subconscious, you know, self-sabotage comes into play is the subconscious will develop ranges of behavior. So it'll, it'll develop, it'll kind of observe your mother and father first, first and foremost. Right. What's their income? What do they do before work? What do they do after work? Uh, what shows do they watch? What's the general vibratory essence of the household? Is it panicked? Is it fearful? Is it stressful? And, yeah. it, and it wants you to make sure that you fit in mm -hmm. to the, you know, that's, that's the safest way to mitigate interaction with any human is to mimic them. Conform. To conform because humans love people like themselves. Yep. And that's why I, you know, I have a good attraction to you and you think, you know, cause we, we have similar belief systems. Right. And, and the subconscious mind is aware that this is the best way to sort of survive those very traumatic uh, formative years where you don't have the physical strength to maybe fend off an attack. And if you are different, you're more likely to be criticized or ostracized or attacked. And this is what the subconscious is good for, helping us survive those early years by making us mimic the tribal rituals and the ceremonies and all the customs and the norms. But, and it, the subconscious mind will develop like a glass ceiling and saying, okay, everybody in the tribe seems to drive this kind of car, has this size of house and makes this, this amount of income and even has like the physical appearance. And it'll say, do not, you know, do not go above that particular safety level because you'll be challenging the alpha at that time. Right. And if you want to not survive 25,000 years ago, because this is how old this, this programs are hundreds of thousands of years old for survival, um, you know, mechanisms, you, you have to make sure you never challenge the alpha. So someone grows up sort of wanting to be more, 
and with their health or their wealth or what they achieve in life. And they're always going to be uh, strapped by this sort of programming if they don't know how it works in the brain. Does that make any sense? That, that is awesome explanation and that's perfect explanation. So going back to mimicry, uh, I guess a good question for you would be what we see on TV, what we're seeing out in society, is this uh, good for programming? Is this helping us to achieve our best version of ourselves? <laughs> well, we're not seeing anything really good. What the biggest danger of watching your standard Hollywood or TV entertainment is the facilitation inhibition mechanism. It's been shown and proven that when you watch a movie, and if it's a scary movie, you know, you might sweat and your heart rate goes up and you'll even, everybody's been in a theater in their youth where someone screamed or everybody screamed in unison, or you were in the back row and everybody kind of jumped up and, and got, got afraid at the same time. Right. Your brain is shown not to be able to distinguish that it's a screen as opposed to real life. Mm. So you have the activation of the fight or flight response or the hind brain or what's called the reptilian brain. And that part of the brain is asking you to take some action at that point. So either run away because someone's getting killed or interfere in the killing and, you know, go against the attacker. Mm. But because we watch it and then we, we sit, so we have the activation of the fight or flight response to take, you know, to take action on a crisis and then we sit and we inhibit it. Mm. So, it's, so we're told over and over again, I think someone's measured this in the hundreds of 200 to 400 times per movie that we're getting a signal to take action on a crisis, but we're sitting. So the person leaves the movie theater and they're, they're thinking, oh, that was a great movie, but they don't understand they're taking that facilitated pathway mm neurological pathway outside the theater, uh, the, the brain registers potentially a crisis in the personal life, and then they sit and yeah. do nothing. Because that is being, and you see that with, with our clients and with you know, people that we're always trying to help and trying to coach, they have massive crisis in their lives. Yeah. And they're going to have a common, I mean, the combination of self-sabotage um, programming and that has to do a lot with the media as well. But we have the movies teaching us to sit and do nothing in the face of crisis. This is a, an undertone or undercurrent that people just aren't aware of. But we do mimic everything that we, do, we see on the screen, whether it's immediate or down the road. Uh, everybody's quoted Seinfeld quotes. Uh, I'm not too sure how, you, how old you are. Ian. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a big Seinfeld fan. All right, so we'll mimic. We're that's what we're doing. We're mimicking, and in the in Burnaby, BC, when the movie Gone in sixty seconds was released, I, do you remember that movie yep. with Angelina Jolie yep. and, uh, and the stealing? Yeah, stealing the car theft went up sixty percent in a week. Mm-hmm. I'm sometimes there is a debate whether the people who produce the movies are aware of this. But it's definitely uh, a documented effect. Uh, Dr. Jerry Croth from uh, Santa Clara University in California has some great videos on YouTube about this where we mimic what we see. So if we're always watching this negative role modeling, right. and of course, if our, self, if our subconscious mind was downloading very subverted achievement levels when we were a kid, and then we see negative role modeling in all the, in all the films and all the TV shows. Mm-hmm. We become programmed by our initial tribe, our family tribe, and our cultural tribe sort of reinforces this mediocre lifestyle, you know, of sort of, it's, it's, it's like a low-level hedonism is what yeah. it is. Right, yeah. And you're going to have a hard time getting healthy. You're going to have a hard time getting wealthy. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a hard time maintaining your relationships because all you're getting uh, drowned in is a tsunami of negative imagery. And it's really hard for you to be a great, healthy, and 
driven person when all that is coming through the eyes. Being programmed through the eyes is, is a very ancient form of making sure to keep the, the population's behavior in check. Right, so it, the inter, an internal event is the same as having an external event, right? So like if you're having that internal event, it's, it's the same exact thing as if you're watching the TV, right? So we have the ability to control this to a certain degree, but we're being controlled by outside sources through the eyes, ears, sight, sound, right? Yeah, I t I t when, when I work with my self-sabotage uh, self clients, we will in that four-week driving period that, you know, between the base camps, we will cut out all negative media mm. because it also activates the fight or flight. And in the fight or flight response, your brain wants nothing to do with anything new. Right. When you're afraid, it all, it, all it wants is the same old, same old. It wants to go back to the tribe, the original program, because that's all it knows. Gotcha. When the human brain is active in the fight or flight response, it, it doesn't want to take on any new projects because new projects brings fear, mm -hmm. but you're already afraid. So right. it wants absolutely nothing to do with the new job or the new internet company you might want to start selling stuff online or the new diet it just wants you know the old friends the old weight the old french fries the old pizza yep. and the old rituals that means getting any getting a person into the fight or flight can really stop their evolution and that's why i i always talk about caffeine i probably haven't researched any sort of substance that activates the fight or flight uh, more subtly and more effectively than caffeine. Mm. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that, those studies and a lot of those things that you share on it. And if you could just share it, like what, what it does, it keeps you in the sympathetic drive, right? Yeah, and no one would really realize this, but they, if you have, say, a cup of coffee, number one, it shuts uh, blood flow off to your brain for 24 hours uh, at 52%. <laughs> <laughs> and I was as shocked to see that as anybody. Right. I, mean, I did see one neurological specialist uh, eyeball the MRI mm -hmm. at about 40% blood flow reduction to the brain after one, was it a six or eight ounce cup of coffee? Mm. But then in the book Caffeine Blues by uh, Dr. Stephen Chernisky, he, he has the study that it's actually 52%. Mm -hmm. And although the caffeine can clear the system in 24 hours, depending on how effective your liver is. Right. And I've, I've had caffeine poisoning a couple of times in my life. I didn't know what it was, but it was because my liver was very toxic at the time and it couldn't get the caffeine out of my system. Mm. But, you know, there's, there's, it, it's also measured to put you in the fight or flight for three full weeks. Wow. Even after the caffeine is cleared from the system. Yeah. So the fight or flight is sort of like a lot of pathways in the body. Once it's active, it doesn't really shut off when the threat is gone because it takes a lot to sort of initiate it. Right. So because you literally drank poison, ca caffeine is an alkaloid poison produced by many plants and it uses Many plants use the caffeine substance as a pesticide. Mm. Um, and the way some of these pathways in the body works, because you drank poison and because that sets off the fight or flight, the body's not really keen on turning it off just in case you run into similar situations again. All the sort of detox pathways and the fight or flight mechanism appear that it's more efficient to keep them on until the coast is completely clear. So, okay, so you, in, you ingest the caffeine, it's a poison. The fight or flight says, hey, you got a poison in your system. So it sets off the alarm bells. And then right. you go into this mode, and of course you're not gonna get blood flow to the brain, right? Because it's gonna go to the arms and the organs and all right. that stuff. And then it stays in that, that range for th up to three weeks, potentially. Yeah, I was shocked when I read that too. And of course right. the fight or flight system has benefits. I mean, it's not a it's not a fault of the body that it has a part of the brain. It's hyper aggressive. Mm. 
it's low IQ. It couldn't do its job if it was high IQ because it's the Ministry of Defense. Right. Yeah. You know, if you're going to fight or you're going to run really fast or, and it doesn't have like deep IQ, it doesn't want you thinking about, uh, you know, your life when you're in a fight. Yeah. What, what kind of legacy am I going to leave? It doesn't want those deep questions coming into the brain because if, if you make a misstep for a millisecond, you might not live. Right. So th the fact that that part of the brain is on for three weeks after one cup of coffee and given that part of the brain also simply wants the same old, same old, all the old tribal affiliations, it becomes very clingy to the old rituals. Mm. You can see how caffeine ingestion from a self sat like we don't want the clients, like as a self-sabotage coach, I don't want the clients clingy to the old rituals because the old rituals are killing them. Right. They're it's like you can't heal in the same environment that got you sick. Right. We have to, th there's the opposite part of the brain is the prefrontal cortex, which is just behind the forehead. Mm. And that has the higher IQs. And if you're going to do something new, like something adventurous, start a business, lose weight, and maybe stop drinking in, in a family of drinkers, mm -hmm. the prefrontal cortex will say it's still dangerous, but proceed with caution. Right. So we need to get the client into the prefrontal cortex by cleaning up their metabolism. And then that part of the brain allows you to tippy toe forward. Right. But in the opposite part of the brain, you know, the limbic system, which is just around the ear, mm -hmm. it, it, ha it will not allow you any progress, any new ideas, any change. It's anti-change. Mm. So as a self-sabotage coach, I would be looking for, you know, all the modalities by which the person is hurting themselves and keeping themselves down. And a lot of them is by activating the limbic system and shutting down the prefrontal cortex. So I have a very long questionnaire with my self-sabotage clients to sort of highlight without them knowing, of course, that I'm simply looking for ways that they play small. Mm. how they hurt themselves, yeah. how they keep themselves down. And a lot of my clients might ask, well, when I reverse those and take those out for the four weeks that we're going to drive ahead without any of these modalities of self-abuse in play, how do I rise up? Mm -hmm. What else do I have to do? Right. And I tell them, well, go to a hot air balloon festival and as they cut the rope on the balloon and unpeg themselves, what does the balloon have to do to rise up? Mm. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's what it does naturally. Right, it's just, that's just what happens. Yeah. And then I warn them as well about the fear that the subconscious, the glass ceiling, the very limited range, so as they're rising up and becoming healthier than their tribe, wealthier than their tribe, more focused than their tribe, more, mm -hmm. you know, more mature than their tribe. Right. They can expect uh, the subconscious to come in and try to sabotage the ascent. Right. And the, 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 the go ahead. Do you want to? I was just going to say, because there also is the crab mentality that are trying to pull these people back down and it's uncool, right? To be healthy. So as soon as you start saying, oh, I'm no longer drinking or I stopped caffeine, people are like, hey, man, come on, what are you doing? That's exactly, you know, the crab in the crab bucket. But what's funny, if you study deep enough, they're actually trying to protect you, which ah. is the funny part. They're saying, don't you know yeah. that having a Mercedes instead of a, a Chevy is going to get the judgmental eye of the tribe? Are you sure you want to be doing this? Yeah. Are you sure you want to lose weight and uh, be great and and sort of insult the under the other underachievers in the tribe because they're not going to like that? Mm -hmm. So the crabs are just they want you to stay for them as well. Yeah, because the bigger group is the safer group. So if everybody starts migrating away, <laughs> they're really nervous that one they know they're not strong enough to stand on their own. So they're like, if all everybody becomes healthy, I have to become healthy. Yeah. 
and that takes a lot more effort than being uh, sick. And if you look at it in the self-sabotage realm, it does take a lot of effort to stay down. Yes. It, now, it, 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 so for somebody watching this who might be thinking, hey, um, I think I might be self-sabotaging. Um, how, where do they look for signs? And then can you give an example of somebody that you've worked with that you've, you've taken these low level activities, removed them and then saw them elevate? Oh, they elevate right away. But the, the signs would be, um, the first signs are sort of a frustration or a low level depression mm. that, so you can never shut off. The body's only happy when it's like, if you read the work of Carl Jung or Sigmund Freud, and they studied people that are depressed or down, the only thing they're missing from their lives is a constant evolution of one of their unique talents. Mm. And in our society, the reason there's probably so many depressed people or people that are a little frustrated is because you're really not permitted to express your unique talents. You, in, in the society of sameness, everybody's got to, you know, play to the tribe or play to the average to be safe. And then the human body isn't designed to be happy in that environment. Right. So the first sign is you're getting a little frustrated, but then there's other signs like you start a diet, but you can't hold it. Mm. And you would lose, say you need to lose 50 pounds. Everybody's really good up into nine pounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's the mark. That's the mark because then 10 is double digits and 10 usually means outside someone else. The comfort zone. Yeah. Outside the comfort zone plus your weight loss will be recognized by outside people. Mm -hmm. And that makes the person very nervous because that's a physical recognition that you're making a break for it. Mm -hmm. And, the and some people don't want to be noticed by anybody. They want to hide. Right. Right, exactly. And, and that's, that's sort of what happens is instead of waiting for someone to say, oh, Judy, you lost weight. Are you doing a diet? Which would sort of reckon, you know, would set the alarm off in the subconscious brain that you're being different. So you're in a danger zone. The person who's self-sabotaging does a preemptive strike on themselves. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're doing what the tribe will eventually do, but they're doing it early so that the tribe doesn't notice. Mm. That's one of the most common is that the person starts a health-based initiative and then they, they get great results and then somehow they can't maintain them and they stop and gain the weight back. Yeah. And, and the reason health in the self-sabotage field elicits the greatest fear, it's because it's so visible. Like if I was a millionaire and my dad only made not, you know, didn't become a millionaire, I can hide my millionaire status. Not everybody's going to see my house. Not everybody's going to see my car. Right. So it's not as, it doesn't register as danger mm -hmm. in the subconscious mind as much as me walking into a room at 50 years old and being the best shaped person in there. Now, I, I can't hide my health. I could hide my wealth. I could hide my wife. I could hide my kids' achievements. Anything above that range that was set subconsciously can be hidden except your health. Okay. So in the realm of self-sabotage, self-sabotaging health initiatives is the number one display because everybody's going to know this you can't hide now what about um so from what i've read and understand zero to seven the brain is uh vibrating at a lower frequency so that's where a lot of the programming is done right so there's a lot of this programming that's running on the subconscious is done at those young ages right do you deal with people who have had trauma and maybe that trauma is part of the issue that's holding them back? Or do you see where trauma comes into these uh, scenarios? Yeah, trauma definitely is going to come in. But I try to tell them, if we go back to the trauma all the time, we have to be careful because that when they go back to the trauma, they'll take the view that they're still of that age. Mm -hmm. 
and go course, back to that that feeling and that time yeah okay right the whole idea about trying to deal with trauma successfully is telling them it was a number one if you get caught in the trauma cycle you can take the baton from your abuser and then pay it forward onto yourself mm. it has to be you know tabled that it's probably not the most logical way to deal with abuse is for you to become the abuser of yourself right number two we have to recognize that in our adult years, we're no longer as vulnerable. And we can bring an adult based and a more mature psyche to the situation to try and modify our beliefs to get out of it. And okay. the only way to sort of get out of it as well is to have that foundational health as, you know, your, your, you know, your power in that. Mm. It's going to be hard to bypass PTSD and other trauma-based impacts if you're in the fight or flight. That makes total sense. Because that part of the brain wants to hurt self, hurt mm. others, highly aggressive. And, you know, and it doesn't, the thing, the worst thing about the fight or flight, the very low IQ part, it has no ability to judge the long-term consequences of its actions. Mm. And so- It just snap, it's react. It's, it's, it, it reacts based on, you know, a lot of the tribal influences and there has to be a, a, a journey to the prefrontal cortex where the, the IQ is higher so that we can maybe stop abusing ourselves and start to think out where this is all leading. Mm. And it's what allows us to be human. Yeah, and we can't also uh, repress. There's, repression is very, we can't forget about the trauma either. Mm -hmm. As human beings, we have to recognize the good and bad in society and the good and bad in ourselves. A lot of my clients have a perfectionist syndrome where they're always trying to repress the sexual side of themselves or... Yeah. Uh, the side that wants to, you know, have some fun. And if you hold that part of yourself un under the water line in the, in the shallow pond too long, it'll, it'll come up and make you pay later. Yeah. So we have to recognize the trauma and that there's some evil people out there. And then we have to apply the clean adult psyche to navigate our way to safer waters, knowing that if we don't do that, there's a very good chance we're going to take the baton from our abuser and self-abuse because we would be mimicking the abuse that they put on to us, but we're going to do it by our own hand. Yeah, which happens, right? Oh, you know, like, for example, they say that abusers, 10% of the abused become abusers, right? So some of these people recover from it. Some of them are using that as a kind of escapism or whatever. Yeah, most of the psychology, it's always good to look internal because although 10% or even 20% will go on to abuse third parties or people outside of yourself, like a lot more would abuse themselves. Mm -hmm. And it, it shows up in the psyche as the same thing. It's just abusing yourself. You wow. know, that's where the cigarettes come in and the alcohol and you know Instagram addiction and scrolling addiction and yeah. all these things are are sort of ways to play small and uh, trim your tall poppy and, and not live to your full potential. They're all little modalities of self abuse and all these topics we're talking about, Ian. They're all interconnected in some way. Yeah, it's powerful stuff. So do you have an example that you can give of like somebody who had, I mean, I guess obviously coffee is one of them, which by the way, um, I, I haven't drank coffee for years and years, but I know exactly what you're talking about because I've had the exact experience. Um, when I've drank coffee, um, I get into the sympathetic drive, I can't sleep. And then it's been some of the worst withdrawals that I've ever had in my entire life. And so that's enough of a sign to show me that it's bad. But what do you say to people like, for example, not, you know, Mercola will throw out there uh, the studies showing coffee is amazing and it helps you live longer. And, um, you know, there's got to be, is there a dark and a light to it or is it all darkness? I think anybody that 
wants to investigate the coffee issue should read Caffeine Blues by Dr. Okay. Stephen Trinisky and just sort of come up on, on all the very detrimental things that coffee does and then drink it themselves. Yeah, and, and see drink, for themselves. Yeah. See for themselves and, and, you know, do six weeks off it and then go back on and then maybe bring in some, your wife or your spouse or your partner to give some, some feedback yeah. about yeah, your yeah, yeah. attitude. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, because it does trigger the fight or flight, the limbic system, the reptilian brain. Yeah. And that part of the brain is known to mark, it's almost like a cruise missile system. It marks things as the enemy that are not the enemy because mm -hmm. that's what that part of the brain does. I mean, it's, it's marking who needs a beating or who's the threat. Yes. And that's if awesome. your wife is next to you and somehow you look over and she says a little thing to make you mad well in the limbic system it's not going to register as a little thing she's going to register as an immense threat to you mm -hmm. so how you know it, it's really important that people experiment on their own and uh, but when we do the base camp method with my self-sabotage clients I, I always make sure we're, we're as clean as possible to give yeah. them that reference point because I know they're going to go back, but if you make it, if you make that four week period, the best period of their life, they have great ideas, they're, they're motivated, they're loving and they're enthusiastic. And then you have the coffee, everything goes dark right away. That's mm -hmm. a very important lesson. Yeah. The, the contrast. Yeah. It's important it's like, to have the contrast. Yeah. Okay. So is there, would you say there's top sabotage, toxins or things that people are doing so like coffee would be one alcohol is probably another thing uh is it just like zoning out on facebook and instagram like what would you say the top things are well it would be sort of how someone would knit those together into uh like a macrame like a oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because in the morning they'll have the coffee then they'll have the break. They'll be scrolling Instagram. Right. Then they'll have the sugar, the macadamia nut cookie from Subway, which we all used to plow down when we used to eat there in our 20s. Right. And then the person will go home and they'll have a glass of wine and then they'll have some trash fire media, mm -hmm. we call it. And then they're, they're, they're limbic. They go fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And then the next day it starts all over again. Mm-hmm. So it, it's sort of... And the more it happens, the worse you kind of go downhill. Yeah, because your body really doesn't want to do that. It always wants to become better. And you have to be very aware of how clever the subconscious mind is to mimic your old tribe. I was working with a very wealthy man here in Canada. Mm. We managed to get him off some narcotics. And he was well aware he was doing the narcotics because he was trying to trim his own poppy. He was so much wealthier than his father mm. and that he felt very guilty on a subconscious level because he was challenged the alpha and made the alpha look like a fool mm -hmm. on the financial side of things. So he's always trying to destroy his wealth, which basically the subconscious was trying to get him back down to the tribal ceiling of mm -hmm. maybe 100000 a year in right. income and he was making two million dollars a year wow and we got him off uh you know we got him off the drugs and i had warned him that the subconscious is very clever and knows that you're off and that you're starting to rise up and it, it registers as a threat the subconscious isn't trying to throw your life into the ditch mm -hmm. it's just trying to say look you got to stay at this level keep you and safe all of keep you safe and then i was reading in the newspaper that he had a big affair and so <laughs> i phoned him and i said didn't i warn you about that and he says i never thought of that in terms of my subconscious would invent something else to yeah. bring the panic and tragedy and you know subversion of my goals mm -hmm. and i said yeah because it, it'll do it'll i've seen the subconscious organize car accidents uh Yes. Fall downstairs to mm -hmm. break the leg. As soon as they lost 20 pounds, oh, whoa, they fell down the stairs. Well, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. well, that happened because, you know, you're in the danger zone. You're outside the safe range. Right. And the subconscious 
controls 95 to 99% of our behavior and our metabolic functions, it has yep. no problem organizing a trip. Mm -hmm. No trip down the stairs, you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Say someone's self sabotaging. Now, there's so the healing summit is kind of in alignment with this idea that I have, uh, which is called healing hacks. Right. Everybody wants to know about hacks that they can use, and uh, there probably is no real hack. Right, we're talking about it now. But if you had to say that there was something that people can do listening to this, how could they take action very simply that would just make their life a little bit better or maybe spark the healing process? Well, I think if they could just two things I would say. Okay. And try to get a little bit cleaner so that you're you can actually recognize your own illogical behavior without making excuses for it. Right. Yeah. And, and then you should be asking yourself, once you're clean with a little bit of health, you know, and the foundations of health, I'm sure, you know, some of the other speakers will talk about them, you know, more water, mm -hmm. better sleep, eating more whole live food from a farm, not a factory. Right. Exercising a little bit. And then once you're a little clean and your prefrontal cortex is starting to flicker back on, mm -hmm. start asking yourself, am I doing what I'm doing? So well, regardless of the situation, say you're smoking a cigarette. Mm -hmm. so am I doing what I'm doing because I'm, it's safer to be mediocre in a society that it attacks anybody that rises up to their full potential. Could I not really be addicted to the nicotine? Could I be addicted to playing small mm -hmm. and never rising up because I'm, I'm scared and I'm using the cigarette to hold me back. Am I using the medication to hold me back? Right. Am I using, you know, the negative self-talk that goes on between our ears at time. Am I using all these things where they appear to be different, but are they in the same category as holding me back and pegging my hot air balloon to the ground simply because I was never given any mentorship on how to fly the balloon? Right. Simply because I maybe have stalled my evolution through the use of some of these sedative substances. Yeah. They stall your evolution. So, you, you know, they say that you'll never become a good sales, uh, you know, be very good at sailing the high seas unless you get that ship out of the bay. Right. And perfect example. Yeah. yeah you got to maybe have a little bit of courage to face the, the, the world in its true reality. Yeah. I've, I've heard an, another saying just e exactly in line with what you're saying is, um, a master captain was never made, you know, never made a master captain by sailing in calm seas, right? Exactly. So you got to get out there a little bit. And it's, it's important to know that, that, that pain, like if your life is sort of painful without the sedation of the cigarettes, um, every struggle is everybody struggles, mm -hmm. but the only struggle that's worth it is when you struggle to become better. Because mm -hmm. that's the only time that the body will hand out happiness to you. Right. I struggle as well. I, and so do you. You struggle to make the business run. You, make, you struggle to make your clients come. Right. You, you struggle, but you struggle for greatness. So if we're going to struggle anyway, struggle to become better, because that's the only time happiness, the happiness chemical will be gifted to you by your body and soul. Mm. And that, that's very important. And the pain of feeling, you know, I tell people, my life used to suck. And I decided that I wanted to feel it in its full suckness. <laughs> and I stole that phrase from J.P. Sears. Which he coached me a little bit himself. Yeah. And so I took away all the modalities of sedation, things that calm the neurological system, the caffeine, the alcohol, the media. And right. my life was very, very painful. But then if you go back to the works of Freud and Carl Jung, they will say, you need the pain to become a better person and evolve. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So all those years I was sedating to my pain, not only did it destroy me, mm -hmm. I stalled my uh, like a decade of evolution right. because I wasn't, I didn't have the courage to sit with my own pain and then modify and morph myself into something better. Mm. And that's like a double whammy, right? To pollute yourself and then to stall your maturation. Yeah. So you live in this arrested development of a, like I'm a 40 year old, but I'm acting like a 25 year old. Right. Yeah. That's hard. And, and then I was depressed. And I mean, the, one of the sayings is every, every master was a disaster. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people who don't know me are afraid to approach me as a self sabotage coach because they believe <laughs> they put I you on a pedestal or something. But okay. anybody who goes and reads my articles, I think I have about 1,600 articles on my website, they'll know that whatever they did, I, I mean, there's not many that could hold a candle to my self-sabotage. Yeah. I was the gold medal winner. Um, whatever you did, I did worse. And that's how I know the full spectrum from addiction to healing, mm. and every kind of psychological step in between, not right. only from the research, but because I lived this yeah. in a bad way at one time. That's awesome. So you, you literally like flipped it. You went from the bottom of the barrel and now you kind of rised above. So you, um, you're, you're carrying the light to other people. Yeah, I think it's important to try and tell them it's, it's possible mm -hmm. that if you're you know, a narcotic addict or you're an alcoholic mm -hmm. or you're smoking a lot of my people too are are women or men that need weight loss help but weight loss is just or someone that carries a little bit of extra weight it just indicates what they're doing you know their habits right and that they're using some of those habits to keep themselves down and then maybe their their family tribe was a little bit heavier as well so it's just easier to go over heavier right and you have to have some courage to show up i mean if everybody in your house was about 240 it's going to take a lot of courage to show up at 170 and maybe bring your own organic meal. Yeah, <laughs> believe me, <laughs> I know exactly how that is. So basically get clean so that the prefrontal cortex can start flickering on. So what, what I heard from you there was basically get back to nature like we started off the conversation. It's like getting back to the clean food, right? How we used to live probably when we didn't have options of poisoning ourselves. Um, yeah. And then from there, what's the next step? The, the next step is to, to observe yourself without judgment. Okay. Don't, you know, if you see yourself doing something bad, I say, if you see your hand on a donut, you know, stick it in your mouth, but, <laughs> but understand, you've got to ask your question, why are you doing that? You yeah. know, it's not healthy for you. Yeah. Could you be potentially using the donut to keep yourself down? Where, when you're capable of so much more. And given that the body doesn't like the donut, it doesn't like the stagnation that many donuts will bring into your life, mm -hmm. you know, when do you think the depression is going to come? Are, yeah. you, are you willing to make a break for it and maybe do four weeks mm. where there's no, there's no toxins, there's no self-abuse? And sometimes the four-week period is simply to show you how uncomfortable you feel. Yeah. Right. And then you have to ask yourself, why do I feel so uncomfortable being my absolute best? Yeah. Because your family tribe, negative role modeling media and all, all other cultural influences that tell you you're safer and more secure when you you don't rise up to your full potential. And it's a trap. Like it's yeah, um, I could make a lot more friends and more well liked in my community if I just towed the party line right. and conformed with the, the media government dictates. Yeah. But, you know, it's a trap. Well, if there's anyone that's anti-conformist, I would say it's definitely you. But well, that's what your, your appeal is, right? You're speaking from authenticity. You're speaking from truth. And it can, you can see it clear. It's coming from a soul level. And that's impacting the world. So, um, yeah, this is awesome stuff. Well, I appreciate you recognizing that. And I just, I'd love to walk my street and not see any sick kids or anybody overweight. It's, mm -hmm. it's a love I have for people's potential. 
mm-hmm. that gets me so fired up because people are like, how are you so fired up all the time? Because I want everybody to rise up and, and do their best. Yeah, we're all connected. Yeah. So if, if other people are suffering, we're suffering too. Yeah, I can't, I can't really take a day off because, you know, the evil parts of society d- doesn't take a day off. Mm-hmm. But there's becoming more and more people that are taking their health seriously. This, this cycle of light and dark is as old as time itself. Right. We're, we're definitely coming out of a dark phase into a lighter phase. Everybody mm-hmm. can be rest assured that evil is clumsy by its nature. Mm-hmm. It's sort of inept and it's making a lot of uh, mistakes. missteps yeah. and mistakes and its yeah. day is coming. And everybody's sort of doing what I'm saying anyway. It's rising up where they can and, and constantly pushing forward, which is something they, they haven't done in a while. So I'm really happy we're around to see that. It's an interesting time to live. Definitely. And uh, I'm really grateful that I got on the uh, interview with you. And um, we're about the bottom of the hour. And um, so I'd like to ask you, is there any last things that you'd like to tell the viewers that you'd like to share with the viewers about health, healing, or anything, or maybe just where they can connect with you on Facebook, Instagram, wherever you are? Well, I'm on Facebook if they want to ask me questions. And um, I talk about a wide array of issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure some of them people will like. And if if you don't like the other ones, maybe you can leave those alone. But if you're looking for self-sabotage help, I consider self-sabotage the crux of all success. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know that your family tribe and your cultural tribe inhibit your greatness, and if you don't know how it works and you need someone to look over, I have a I think an 80 uh, point questionnaire where I can draw out of anybody the tools they're using to keep themselves down. And then I'll just list them and I send them a summation of exactly what they have to do. And we only push for, you know, for two to two to six weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. If they're looking for that kind of information, they can find me on Facebook and Jason Kristoff. It's uh, Christ with an OFF on the end. And if they want to contact me, I can give them the information about how they can start the process. And I give a lot of free information about overcoming self-sabotage on my Facebook page. And a lot of people have healed themselves just from the free info. Awesome. I'm a fan. I've gained a lot from it. So uh, thank you again, Jason Kristoff. I appreciate you spending the time and sharing this information. So everybody, uh, you can find them, Jason Kristoff, on Facebook. and. Uh, Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Very welcome, Ian. Thank you for having me on. All right. Take care.